is not bringing about joy in the relationship needs to be explored. Now, our problem is that if we're always in trouble and we keep going to each other and we're always in trouble, stop. You know what we need to stop doing? Going to each other. Okay? I look at people and, 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 and I look at a church and I tell people, if you want to know the church, look at the pastor. If you want to know the pastor, look at the people. There are so many bad marriages in our churches and it's not godly. And the reason they're bad is because of the head. If the pastor and his wife have a good marriage, then the marriages in the church have a much greater chance of being successful marriages. And uh, if, they, if the pastor and his wife have a miserable marriage, then it's probably going to be the way for most of the folks uh, in the church. Uh, and so there are a lot of people who walk around who are just regularly unhappily married. Uh, and then, and not just married, you have folks who are single, who have all the answers about being married, and guess what they never get? Married. They have all the answers because you keep running in the same circles with the same people, regurgitating the same foolishness. Everybody's always in the midst of the read. There are women who sit around and say they're saved. I'm talking about folks who are testifying to being saved. Women who sit around in the church and, and in their minds really think about how unhappily married they are and wish that they were not in their situation, in their condition. Still come to church, holler, dance, clap hands, speak in tongues, sing to the top of their voice, and some sing real pretty. All that stuff getting up and giving powerful testimonies and, and all of this and rocking the church. But their private lives are absolutely miserable. And they cannot be helped because they're always stuck in the same place. Now the Bible says it gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers. So there, there's a reason God put those four gifts uh, in the church. Uh, and Unfortunately, the church doesn't use those gifts. And so we rely on, there are things, there, are, there no man can answer every question. No man can understand every issue. But God can. What happens is that we get bogged down in our faith in a man. And we can't hear anybody else because it's strictly what my pastor says. Don't get stuck on me, get stuck on the word. The comfort has to be in that I bring the word, not because you like me. You follow me? It has to be in, I love the word of God. And it, as long as I'm being fed the word, not opinions. See, we get up, a lot of, a lot of stuff we do in church is, is based on experiences. My experiences are not going to keep you saved. They're not going to save you. What, what saves us and keeps us saved is the word of God. So if I take the word of God, now I'm, I'm not uh, uh, teaching you how to live holy based on what I think, based on church traditions, but based on the word of God. Teach you how to be happily married, not based on opinions of church traditions or societal influences, but strictly on the word of God. Anyone, if you take a man and a woman who are committed to obeying God, a man and a woman who are committed to the word of God, they're going to have a good marriage. Because she's going to walk in obedience to God's word. He's going to walk in obedience to God's word. You can't go wrong if you're obeying God. Our problems is start listening to people instead of hearing from God. And so we try this marriage thing by listening to people. You don't need nobody telling you how to prepare your underwear for your husband. What lingerie to put on? How to seduce them? You don't. That's that. You don't need that. You got that in your nature. Need nobody to tell you how to do all that stuff in the bed. And the church spends too much time in people's bedrooms. We spend too much time interfering in people's relationships. When when there's a relationship, I'm the pastor, but the relationship is not my business. That's your relationship. I ain't marrying you. I ain't gotta live with you. Understand? But we get so caught up in the ways of man. We get caught up in our church traditions. And now the pastor wants to tell you who you can and cannot talk to. 
who you can and cannot marry, all this stuff. Now, there are times where I know God tells somebody to tell you, leave them alone. For sure. But this matchmaking foolishness that happens in the church is what's destroying a lot of folks in church. A lot of folks grew up in church and miserable because they married who the church put them with. Now, not who they wanted to be with. They married who the church put them with. All oh, because she's a good church member. That doesn't make her a good wife. Yeah. Because you're a good church member doesn't make you a good husband. No, nope, doesn't make you that. What makes you a good husband, a good wife, is your obedience to the word of God, doing what God says is being a husband, is being a wife. God gives me instructions about being a, a husband, a father, and a pastor. So I have to take all the instructions, stop baby, I take all the instructions about being a husband, a father, and a pastor. And I have to obey the word of God. Not based on what some man showed me, what a man tell, told me, not, but based on the word of God. Two people who come together, both say they're saved, and they're obedient to the word of God, they will have a, a joyful marriage. But there's, so, there's so much misery in the church in terms of marriage because people are not being taught the word of God. You can't know something you're not taught. And the Bible says, I can hear without a preacher. Well, the preacher has to teach the people the word of God. We get all excited. We're going to have we're gonna have a singles ministry. Really? All these singles come together? Ain't nothing but trouble. She She's single, he's single. What are they going to talk about? But anyway. So, why is the church sanctioning this foolishness? Oh, we're going to have a, we gonna have real talk tonight, y'all. That's right. You ain't got to be bored to be saved. Being saved, you got to be born to your bedroom. That's none of my business. What happens your bedroom is none of my business. Because what happens in my bedroom ain't none of your business. What I like talking to somebody else about what happens in my bedroom. Why would the church be involved in talking about a woman seducing her husband? Well, how you should do this and do that. So on. Well, anyway. So y'all see why so many folks are messed up in church. Because we don't take the word of God. We take man's wisdom. And so we find ourselves in trouble. And so... Again, Love Day 20, 2014, uh, don't marry him, leave her alone. Somebody's got to tell you, and not tell you what to and to not do, but tell you how to and to not do. And so you learn some stuff, learn how to make some decisions based on information, Bible information, not from my days running as a, on, in the streets as a sinner, understand? But what does the Word of God say about our relationships now? We talk about marriage, we call it holy matrimony. But the thought of entering into holy matrimony without practicing holiness in our daily lives is preposterous. There's no way you can engage in a holy matrimony when there is no holiness in your matrimony. Our, our personalities, our uh, tendencies, our habits, our preferences, our ideas, our ideals, uh, and, 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 and our idiosyncrasies are all generally shaped prior to our becoming married. Uh, who and what we are are in large part uh, who we're going to be. So when you, by the time you get married, you're not going to change. You are who and what you're going to be the rest of your life, your natural self. The notion that I will change or that I will improve once I get married uh, is it's, it's seemingly common, but mostly misguided. The belief that our perspectives uh, will change once we say I do is silly. And, and, and the belief that our prospective spouse will become who and what we want them to be is no less erroneous. Uh, the Bible instructs parents to train their child in the way they should go. That's Proverbs 22 and 6. Uh, we're instructed in, in, in Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. Remember now that I created in the days of thy youth. While the, while the years draw nigh, uh, nor, while, the, while the 
evil, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Get the word of God in you, in your youth. In other words, in your formative years, before you become an old stiff tree, you better get it in you while you're growing. Um, it's, it's virtually impossible uh, to discuss marriage without talking about children. Uh, and of course, I'm going to try my best uh, to resist doing so uh, for today's uh, uh, conversation. Uh, but we should always be mindful of how influential parents are in the lives of children considering the effect our parents have had on us, whether it's been a good effect or a bad effect, positive or negative, they still have affected our lives. And so we always have to be mindful of how we deal with our children uh, as parents in terms of preparing them for the day that they have to walk down the aisle with some, uh, with their uh, opposite sex and say, I do. Now, uh, it takes a long time for the human brain to develop about 23 or so years for it's physically fully developed. Uh, and so, but, but as you're going along, you're, 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 you're developing and changing. That's why young people, one day they want to do this, next day they want to do that, or the same day they want to do 50 different things. They have 50 different interests because your brain is not quite mature yet. And, and you know, and, and that's okay. Uh, but we've got to make sure that when you when you marry, more than likely you're going to have children. Uh, and so you have to be cognizant of raising your children in godliness, not just church. A lot of folks are raised in church, but they're not raised in godliness. You've got to be mindful of raising your children in godliness. So you're raising them to be the most healthy husband or wife for another woman or man. Otherwise, you're doing them a disservice. And so we have a chance to intervene in the lives of our children from birth and teach them the ways of God. Teach them how to and how to not do based on the word of God. Not based on what we think or how we feel, but based on the written word of God. Let's think about the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11. It says, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. We have to be careful. We have to be careful what comes out of us, and 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 specifically how we train our children. Uh, if you drop down to Matthew 15, verse number 17, do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entered in at the mouth goeth into the belly, and is cast out into the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. And so, uh, uh, just think about it. Today we focus on raising children. We focus on the physical. And people talk about marriage. They, they focus on the physical, on the outward. Well, we need to focus on what's on the inside of us, okay, in terms of our relationships, in terms of our ultimately rearing children. We have to make sure that what's going inside of our hearts is of God. Uh, but unfortunately, we've devalued, we've immer uh, misinterpreted, and we've misidentified marriage roles in the church. The church has no interest in the word of God. And so uh, many of our relationships are flawed. Society has adopted the idea that women can do anything men can do. Totally distorting and desecrating the order God ordained for our lives. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that the body is made up of many members, all with specific functions. If the hand tries to become the foot, then the body breaks down. Uh, do we really understand 
do we really accept? Do we really appreciate the differences in men and in women? The woman absolutely cannot be the man. Neither can the man be, nor fame be the woman. Uh, statistically, studies show that about 50% of marriages in the United States end in divorce, first marriage. About 67% of second marriages, about 74% of third marriages end in divorce. Now, if the divorce rate is higher as you marry more, then the problem isn't marriage, the problem is you. The problem isn't who you're marrying. And, and the problem isn't the person that you marry. The problem is in your choice of the person you marry. See, some of us are stuck on choosing the wrong people all of the time. And so, uh, you know, again, don't marry him. Leave her alone. And so all of these Folks who say they're saved, well, we we'll look at what's going on in our lives and say, Lord, how are marriages in the church working out? Well, statistics, first of all, statistics suggest that couples with children have a slightly lower divorce rate than childless uh, marriages. Uh, and Childlessness seems to be one of the common causes for, or causes of divorce. Uh, the, the high failure rate, in my opinion, of marriages in our culture is the result of the schizophrenic marriage foundation that most people attempt to build on today. Uh, if it contradicts what the Bible says, then it is wrong and it will not prosper. Even more disturbing, there are studies that suggest that the divorce rate among conservative Christians is much higher than the divorce rate amongst atheists and agnostics. Now, I, I have a personal opinion on that. The mistake folks make in church is I'm saved, I'm God and automatically we're going to have a good, I'm going to be married. No, 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 no. You can plant the best seeds you want, but if you don't cultivate those seeds, it's not going to happen. You got to take care, you know, we, 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 get, we become so blinded in church and thinking that hallelujah is going to make my marriage work. Hallelujah is going to make your marriage work. Because too often your hallelujah is not a genuine praise. Too often your hallelujah is something that we do in the church. Not because you're so appreciative and you're giving God the highest praise because you mean it, but it becomes a habit. Everybody say, click your hand, click your hand, click your hand, clap your hands, have the hallelujah, hallelujah. You don't mean it. It's not, it's not an authentic, sincere praise. But we, we've gotten to the place now where there are a lot of marriages in our churches that we would be better if the people left those churches. Now you, you can't sit under a miserably married pastor and think you're going to enjoy a successful marriage. It's not going to happen. It simply is not going to happen. For one, you're sitting under something that is not ordained of God. If I don't love my wife, then God did, why would God call me the pastor and I don't love my wife? Why would God use me? How can God use me to bless the marriages of the church when my home is a wreck? So there are a lot of people sitting in church and one day, even pastors, how in the world one pastor, one day you, you and your, your first lady, your late lady, y'all married, the next day y'all getting a divorce. Where is God in all of this? And the unfortunate part is that people can't learn differently because they know everything. And you know, folks are afraid to, to come to the to the uh, uh, realization or, or the, to the honest, uh, 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 what you call it, honest uh, uh, con confession that you know what what I'm being taught at my church about marriage is not working. That's why we got so many wrecked marriages. If you have a church with a bunch of wrecked marriages, there's something wrong with the church. 
There's no way in the world you can do what God says through his written word and not have a good marriage. Impossible. If you're obedient to God, you think you're going to be obedient to God and not be happy? That would, that would make God a liar. And guess what God absolutely cannot do? He can't lie. So when you look at church folks and you look at those who are what they call conservative Christians, and, 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 and of course we don't have time to go into all that, but when you look at the church, and you don't see you don't see a difference in the divorce rate in the church that you do outside the church. And there's something wrong with the church. Now I'm, I'm not saying that every time there's a divorce, it's the church's fault. I'm not saying I'm not saying every unhappily married couple uh, is the church's fault. A lot of folks are just disobedient. A lot of people in churches would have been taught how to be a good husband and wife and just don't obey. And then you know nothing you can do about that. But watch them go. Watch their lives fall apart. Uh, but there are things that happen. Uh, in the church, we say we're saved, but we don't want to obey God. If you don't obey God, you have to ask yourself a question, am I saved? If you are disobedient, that's like the sin of witchcraft, right? If you're, if you're disobedient and you're, you're lacking faith, faith in God leads you to, is, is your obedience to God. The reason I do what God says is because I believe God's word. That's my faith in God. But when I'm disobedient to God's word, then I'm demonstrating the absence of the lack of faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So now we talk about our marriage, and I'm still doing a little introduction here. Uh, don't marry him, leave her alone. Uh, and so when we look at the introduction, trying to set the, the framework for the way, you know, we, we, I'm not trying to answer questions or give you the, the answers to all your problems in your life. I'm not trying to be all that. But what's most important is that we learn first how to start asking questions. If you're not bold enough to start asking questions, then you'll never receive any answers. When there is no question, there can't be a, an answer, no solution. So, Understand this, everything we do and say must begin with respect for and adherence to the word of God. Now, void of that commitment, there is no common ground, no consistent spiritual litmus test, if you will, and no space for God to intervene on our behalf. Uh, this journey and receiving clarity, receiving instruction, direction, and deliverance from God must be void of things like, well, I feel, well, I think, well, you know, I've been taught. Those things just won't work. Uh, the way I see it, not going to work. Uh, that was for that time. So we have all these excuses that we make up. Uh, we use all kinds of sad excuses uh, as uh, uh, to not obey what God says. And so all of these excuses and imagined excuses that we try to use as our personal pacifiers for not doing what God's written word instructs, they all fail. They all fall short. Where there is disobedience, there is no God. He is not the God of, or the author of confusion. But he's the God of peace. Now, whether, whether we agree with it or not, God's word is true all by itself. Now, Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 19. says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, in naming the name of Christ, one agrees to obey his righteous instruction, regardless of how they feel. God can say, if you feel good, do what I say, but if you don't feel good, then do it your way. That's not what God tells us. Uh, uh, our problem is ourselves. Now, 
Paul goes on to write in Galatians 5 and 17. He says, For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Your flesh naturally wills to do the opposite of what God commands, of what God instructs, of what God desires, of what God requires. Paul expresses this in Romans chapter 7. Verse number 21, which reads, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now, we back up to verse number 18. Uh, uh, Paul writes, for I know, and this is, this is Romans 7 and 18, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. This reveals the rebellious nature of your flesh to the Holy Ghost or against the Holy Ghost. I don't want that. See, your flesh wants to do what it wants to do. What it does not want to do is what God says to do. Uh, and so, understand again the framework, the foundation for our struggle. You have to understand why you struggle doing the right thing. I'm married. And because I'm married, I'm going to be a good husband, a good wife. That's just untrue. Because I'm saying I'm going to be a good husband, a good wife. That's just not, that's not accurate. It's not accurate. A lot of folks that are saved, but they're disobedient to the word of God. And so you have to be careful. God's foundation stands assured, whether you like it or not. So now, as we try to seek God for better lives, better marriages, more specifically... Uh, let's understand this. We cannot pick and choose what parts of the Bible we're going to obey. 1 John 5 and 17 tells us that all unrighteousness is sin. So, if, if you are disobedient to the word of God, to the instruction of God, then you are sinning. Because that is unrighteous. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's the small, well, listen, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 6. A little leaven. It doesn't take but a little bit to mess it all up. You can't, you can't dally in a, in a little bit of unrighteousness. You can't do a little bit of sin. You've got to reject all of it. You've got to obey the word of God 100%. When God instructs us as husbands and wives, this is the, this is the responsibility of the husband this is responsibility of the wife. When we start crossing those lines, we start blurring the lines, then we're walking out, we're walking out of God's obedience into disobedience. And when you walk in disobedience, you walk out of God. So a little leaven. Leaven of the whole lump. James follows Paul in, in James 2 and 10. For whosoever shall keep the law, the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So we can't pick and choose. Can't decide, well, I do this part, but that part right there, I don't, I don't quite agree with. Really? Wouldn't it be great if we just took the word of God and just obeyed what God says? But the, the, the problem is that we can't hear from God because we're drunk on hearing from man. Okay? And a lot of people in church can't hear if there's not the performance, the deliverance, the delivery that they're accustomed to. Well, I can hear this way. And so our problem uh, is, is that the church has become conditioned to preferring charisma and emotion uh, to performance and to theatrics uh, 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 as opposed to appreciating Bible studied Holy Ghost anointed preaching and teaching. One thing about it is that when the Lord comes through with the word of deliverance, the flesh finds it boring because we think God's going to come through through emotion. And if we, we don't have the Hammond 
a, a wailing and we don't have the hands going up and jumping around and oh it, it wasn't the anointing oh he's anointed now because it's clowning and so you missed the anointing because the anointing of God does not come necessarily with theatrics God can speak in a, in a very calm voice but we're looking for God to speak to us with the rousing and the dousing and what we find ourselves all messed up it is the word of God that makes the difference in our lives. It keeps, gets us, keeps us out of trouble. Now, Psalm 119, 11, we quote it every, every service. Thy word have I, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The power of the word of God. Yes, don't marry him, leave her alone. You want to know how to pick and choose? Read the word of God. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If God's word, you hide in your heart that you might not sin against him, if his word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path, then why are we so drunk on what man says? And what man says is inconsistent with the word of God. Folks teaching you, we, we have these marriage count, uh, conferences all the time. And they're focused on, on romancing you. Teach y'all how to get... They give you giveaways, we give you some, some, some oils and all this kind of stuff to get your freak on. We say, I don't come to church to get my freak on. You understand? And what happens in my bedroom ain't none of your business. And what happens in yours ain't none of mine. Business. I'm not stuck with what you and your wife do together. See, because we start going down that lane, we're going to start doing with each other. Y'all hear me? Amen. I have no business engaging a woman in conversation with my wife is in her bedroom. None. No what happens in mind. None. Not the conversation I have. None. But we become drunk and in church. Oh, we have a, we're going to a marriage conference, to a singles conference. And it's all and it's all this sex, sex, sex. Well, if you keep talking about sex, what you want to be thinking about? That's right. We wonder why we find ourselves in trouble. Well, we've got to become interested in the word of God. So, the word is light to my feet, light to my path. That word of hit in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O God, teach me thy statutes. Huh? Amen. It is the word of God. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Verse 2, but have renounced the hidden things of this dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to the every man's conscience in the sight of God. We don't use God's word to deceive, to manipulate. We don't use God's word for any ungodly reason. So when I'm teaching you how to live, I'm teaching you how to live not according to my standards, but according to the word of God. See, because somewhere in here I'm going to find where I'm falling short. Now, if I'm trying to teach you me, all you're going to learn is me. Uh -huh. Well, guess who's jacked up? All right. Me. All right. So why would you want to learn me? I'm messed up. But it is the word of God that covers all of us. But I don't, I don't know the Lord. And, and here's... Well, let's, let's, let, me, let, me, let me go there. Yeah. So now... Let me go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12. It says, it is, it's commonly quoted, uh, this, this scripture is, in the, in the churches. And it reads, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. This scripture, often quoted, but hardly ever appreciated, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, we're choosing spouses based on flesh and blood when we say we walk in the spirit because we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we've not learned how to identify the spirit in that person who we will really hook up with. Because we say, oh, I like this tall and this, this shade of skin and these eyes and this hair and this, that, and that other thing. And we get all messed up. Oh, I need her. I need to have these measurements and all this kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with your physical preferences at all. Nothing wrong with that. There's something wrong when you ignore all the spiritual things because you're drunken on the natural or physical things. Now, 
You say you're a child of God, and all you're looking at is that she built like a brick house. Understand? And so now you forget, you've not seen anything godly in her. You, you're not even looking for her. You don't even care. <laughs> Only you care about is that that's my wife because she we in church. She says she's saved. I say I'm saved. And she, she built like that, and I can't wait. No God in the equation. So that is a formula for disaster. Uh, so uh, here we are. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Now, in he comes around in 2 Corinthians, or says the part of this, 2 Corinthians 10 and 3. He gives us the answer. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of, of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strong holds, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So our weapons are not carnal, but our weapons are mighty through God. So all of our high, evil, ungodly, and righteous imaginations, the word of God casts them down, brings them into captivity. When they want to disobey God. So now, you become interested in seeing the spirit of the man. The spirit of the woman. And I mean capital S. Not because they smile a lot. But because when I look at the word of God, I have found you in the word of God. In a holy place in the word of God. So this is not in the word of God was defining Ahab. We have to know these things uh, because, you know, too often in today's church, we're telling folks about physical things to look for. Or well, does she clean the house? Well, that's good. That's good. But the woman had to ask herself, can he clean the house? Will he clean the house if I need to? We'll get there. We'll get there. All right? So now, our weapons are not carnal. And they're, they're mighty through God for pulling down the strong holds. And we have a lot of strong holds in our lives, don't we? Obey the word of God. Obey, and I can't say this, can't stress this enough. Obey the word of God and you will stay out of trouble. Disobey the word of God and you're going to find yourself always in trouble. And this includes marriages, and very specifically for today's purposes, this includes marriage. If we are not practicing obedience, then we are demonstrating disobedience. Where there is disobedience, there is confusion. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 and 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all of the churches of the saints. In the churches of the saints, God is present, and God is peace. Where there is confusion, there is no God. If the church is bowed down in confusion, there is no God in control. Now, which means that if the leadership of the church contradicts the word of God, then it is not God's order. It is confusion. Y'all understand? So when God says, the, the word of God says that the head of the woman is the man. In the church, if the head of the man, in the church, if the head of the man is the woman, then it is out of God's order. Follow? So then we go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, verse number 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now, 
You got folks who are so caught up in their own circumstances, situations, until they can't receive the word of God. Well, because I know, I, I know I've seen God. No, no, you've not seen God operate differently. Now you're lying on God. All right. Oh, I saw God work through her. No, 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 no. You didn't see God work through her. That's not what you saw. Remember this. In that day, uh, Matthew chapter 7, in that day, many will say to me in the words of Jesus, Lord, we're not prophesied in your name. Cast out devils in your name. Mm -hmm. The many wonderful works in your name. You're going to say the part, man, never knew you work of it. Worker of iniquity goes against God's word, Amen. against God's instruction, against God's order. So when you work iniquity, you will do things in Jesus' name and they will bring about results. Now, if, if you're going to evaluate, what you're doing based on results. The truth of the matter is the great majority of people you lay hands on, nothing happens. <laughs> you understand me? So if I lay hands on a, on a thousand people and two come back and say they're healed, and I take credit for it, that's right, I prayed, well, let's bring the, let's bring the, nine, the 998 and let them testify that when I lay hands on them, All nothing right. happened. All right. You understand? Amen. So we started identifying all this stuff as God. Oh, I know it's God. I, I know I know it was God because, wait a minute, if it is out of God's structure, if it is out of God's order, how can it be God? Isn't it great when you know the word of God? When you know the word of God, then you don't get caught up in what you see as quote-unquote miracles in the church. Mm -mm. You know the difference. Oh, you prophesied that wasn't God. The damsel with the issue, with the damsel with the spirit of divination, she did what? She prophesied. Yeah. She brought her, she brought her, her, her owner his great gain. Yes, yeah, she did. Simon the sorcerer, they thought he was some great power from God. He bewitched the people. That woman that indoor, she brought up the spirit of the dead prophet Samuel. What power? But none of them were of God. None. At all. But they did miraculous things. So we try, to, we try to identify God in our presence through miracles. Okay. God's presence is identified through righteousness. Righteousness is exalted the nation. Sin is a reproach. If you disobey God, you are a sinner. And sin is a reproach to any people. Hmm? So we, 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 we don't know the word of God. We don't understand the word of God. And we start saying and doing crazy things uh, because, well, the way I've seen it, I, I've seen it, I know it works, I've seen it happen before, so I know God approves it. Be careful. Try the spirits, whether they be of God, and you try them by the word of God. Is that all right? Amen. That's all right. God is not the author of confusion. But he's a God of peace. And if you are not obeying God, then you are not walking in the peace of God. And so it's difficult to receive uh, answers, uh, direction, instruction, uh, and clarity when you don't know the questions. Some of us need assistance with forming the question. Others need encouraging and even prodding to even ask the questions. There just has to be a start somewhere. It has to begin somewhere. Come to appreciate the importance of the word of God in our lives uh, as we say we're people of God and we're trying to, to, to serve a holy God uh, through ungodly means uh, and that certainly is an impossibility uh, and so we uh, what happens to many of us is that 
we too often spend time in conflict. Now, conventional worldly wisdom teaches us that we must be happy in order to make others happy. That's what our conventional wisdom says, worldly wisdom. Unfortunately, this perspective diametrically opposes the Bible's golden rule, which is found in Luke 6 and 31. And it says, And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. This certainly then applies to our marriages. Uh, Paul's instruction in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25 reads, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. My spouse's, my wife's well-being supersedes mine in terms of importance in my life. Our commitment to fully caring for each other means we both are determined to give 100% of ourselves. We then accept 100% that's given to us from our spouse. Uh, and we accept it as we would from ourselves. So we love them more than we love ourselves because the word of God tells me to do so. Now, when we are committed to our 100% contribution, this eliminates the constant conflict through selflessness and through service. It's not about me, it's about my wife. It's not about me, it's about my husband. Now, let, let's revisit the stand that if it contradicts or is any way inconsistent with the Bible, then we need to leave it alone. Uh, it seems that people who call themselves Christians and people of God have a problem with what God has plainly communicated to us through his written word. You don't have to figure this out. I guess that's not hard. Through God's written word, God has spoken it. It's written for our edification. So when we go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it through the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church, who are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall the man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall too, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is the word 
of God. If we were to simply do what God says, we'd find peace in our homes. Now, we've got to learn how to do. This tells us what to do. So there's a process of learning how to do what to do. But you've got to first have a mind to learn to do. If you don't have the mind to serve the way God has instructed us to serve, how in the world are you going to please God? How are you going to be in obedience to God? How are you going to be consistent with God? If you don't have the mind to do what thus said the Lord. Now follow me? So now, let's read on uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Peter writes, now Ephesians was written by Paul. Here, here Peter writes, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, or adorned, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. The, the simple instruction of the word of God, commitment to following what thus saith the Lord. What does the Bible say? What am I supposed to do? I am supposed to do what the Bible says. Well, how do you know what the Bible says if you have no interest in reading the Bible? You have no interest in obeying the Bible. Only thing you want to do is do what you want to do, but then you can never, ever come to uh, uh, reap the benefits of obedience to the word of God. If, again, if the man and the woman are committed to obeying the word of God, there is no way can we have the marriage. If the man and the woman, and I don't mean because you said you're committed to it, I'm talking about in your heart, your heart has shown God that you are committed to him, and so your ways uh, are, are indicative of your commitment or reflective of your commitment to fulfilling the will of God. If that is the case, then you're going to be happily married. Now, if you're dipping and dabbing in your commitment to God, double-minded man is stating all his ways. That is no foundation for a holy matrimony. Now, you have two people be married for 100 years. If there's no God, it's not holy matrimony. It's matrimony. Two people can be friends forever and never have a falling out. That's not a big deal. I've got a gazillion first cousins. Just first cousins. Forget about the second. All my cousins. I've never had a fight with a cousin. Never. I've never fallen out with a cousin. I've never had an argument. I've never had any conflict with a cousin. None. Never. So. <laughs> and. Right. And. What next? Big deal. That doesn't mean there's any God. Most of the time I wasn't saved. Most of the time I wasn't saved. I had a conflict with my cousin. So, there was still no God. It was not a God relationship. It was still a familial relationship. We just didn't have, we just didn't have fallen out. So, what does that mean? Follow me? So somebody, some people can marry and not fall out, but don't think it's God in it. Some folks fall out because some folks don't fall out for a lot of other reasons. You know, some folks, some women scared to disagree with their husband because you're gonna get knocked out. 
Yeah. Her whole, her whole the relationship is based on fear. If I don't do, you're going to kill me. So she's a good, good, submissive woman out of fear. Not out of respect of, for and obedience to God's word, but out of fear of her man or, or the man fear of the woman, whatever the case may be. But when we fall in love with the word of God, When we fall in love with the word of God, then we find peace in our relationships. Our marriage then is a peaceful experience. Why? Because my commitment is to pleasing God. And if I'm committed to pleasing God, then my, my, my God tells me I love my wife as Christ loved the church. If I'm committed to pleasing God, then my, my, my Bible tells me that my husband is my head. And I am to obey him. Amen. Understand? Amen. Now, didn't I take all the guessing out of it? I don't even have to think about this. God told me to love my wife more than I love myself. Now, there's no thought to this. This is just, it becomes who and what you are. You don't have to think about loving them. Just love them because that's the way it is. Because you're obedient to the word of God. Now, obedience to the word of God is an, is an internal experience. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not this external exhibition of humility. Folks get up to church and how humble they are, right? Thank God for I'm humble. Well, you just prove you're not humble. You say you're humble, you're dead. There's nothing humble about bragging about being humble. That's the, that's the opposite of humility. Okay? So, humility to God's word, there is, there is observe. Uh, observable uh, uh, behavior. I can tell by the way he behaves that he loves the Lord. That she loves the Lord. Not because they come to church and speak in tongues and howl and dance and kick and shout and preach and teach. Not because of any of that. I can look at your lifestyle and based on how you carry yourself. When I, when I saw my wife, I watched her and, and what made me fall, y'all heard me say this many times, what made me fall in love with my wife was the way she loved Jesus. Not because she was a church girl, because she wasn't born and raised in church like that. But she was a Jesus girl. And me and my dumb self, my brain kicked in for a quick second, some smartness, and said, if she can love Jesus like that, you know she can love you. That's the one I need, see. So then my heart fell for her because I loved the way she loved Jesus. She was a Jesus for that. And she didn't walk around always talking about Jesus. She, you know, she wasn't always in church cutting up. But I could tell through her, through her, the way she carried herself. I could tell through her faithfulness that she loved Jesus. And I knew she's a fanatic, so am I. This fanatic needs a fanatic to do fanatical things. So, you know, and you see the, the, the heart. I saw the heart she had for Jesus and know that if she loved Jesus like that, she's going to be good. Because when you love him, you obey him. I said, when you love him, you obey him. And you can't say you love Jesus and you disobey him. If you disobey him, you don't love him. Loving him is obeying him. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? So now, we find ourselves uh, 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 oftentimes in church in trouble unnecessarily. Uh, and a, a common mistake that we make is that we choose people who are incompatible with us. Uh, as people who wish to be obedient to the word of God, we are instructed that in Proverbs 18 22, he who findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So, when I found my wife, I found my good thing, and I obtained favor of the Lord. But women today are taught to find a man, especially considering the few good men who are perceived to be available. So, I got, I'm going to find me one. Well, child, you got to go make yourself, you got to make it happen, girl. Mm -hmm. Many men choose to try out as many women as possible before they choose a 
a bride. Uh, the problem is they're bringing all of those experiences and spirits into their relationship. Uh, carefully exploring who and what your potential uh, spouse is all about or better learning your current spouse can be a rewarding exercise. The key to learning people is being objective, uh, observing, not to evaluate, uh, but to learn. And only after you learn someone can you form an opinion, not judgment, but an opinion. Uh, too often, we try to make a potential spouse fit the image we are willing for them, as opposed to accurately capturing the image they project. Call it what it is. Don't try to make them, well, it's okay, well, I can, well, that, when I marry, they're going to be better, they're going to do better. No, 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 no. It is what it is. Capture the image. Capture the moment. It is what it is. If it disgusted you yesterday, don't think it's not going to disgust you tomorrow. You get to today, and now you want to ignore it. No, 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 no. If it turned your stomach a week ago, it's going to turn your stomach Again. Y'all hear me? So, you want to know them, observe them, be honest though. And in the uh, 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 book of Amos, chapter 3, verse number 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, many of us attempt to walk together void of any common ground. We constantly disagree because we have not been agreed. And if you've not been agreed, all you're going to ever walk in is conflict. So, uh, do we ask ourselves what are the most important attributes in a potential spouse? That's a question, right? Do we seriously consider them, pray about them, and then not compromise them? What are your physical preferences? What are your emotional requirements? Uh, what are your moral qualifications? What are your spiritual compatibility standards? Uh, and I'm talking about spiritual compatibility beyond talk. But seriously considering the level of faith and the walk with Christ. I know you talk good game in church. But every time out of church, uh, you ain't doing nothing holy. Understand? Mm -hmm. Why is that we say we're saved every time I talk to you on the phone, you want to have sex talk? We say we're saved, and all you ever want to do when we're alone is get nasty. And you don't ever want to talk about getting married. You just want to show getting nasty. All right. There are questions that we have to ask in terms of serious talk, serious conversation, uh, ask yourself if you're feeling or experiencing feelings of lust, of infatuation, or is it true love? It's a question to ask yourself. Are you marrying primarily because the Bible says it is better to marry than to burn? 
And so you're burning in your flesh. You just want to fix. And the way to get your fix is to have an I do session. Ask, did God join you together? Did your friends join you together? Did your church join you together? Did the two of you join yourselves together? Here's a question for you. Does God actually tell you to marry that person? God told me, you're my wife. Well, the Bible says he can find another wife, find a good, good thing. Well, God told me you're the one. Did he? Did God tell you she's the one, or did God tell you she's okay for you? I prove her. Not this. Now, there's a difference in God told me you're the one, or I wanted you and God didn't say no. Or did God say anything? Or, well, you know, your flesh would be God talk a whole lot, right? And God ain't said nothing. But your flesh will blame a whole lot of stuff. It'll, it'll attribute a whole lot of information to God. God has not spoken. So these are, these are some questions that you need to ask yourself. Uh, as a man, are you looking for a woman who's like your mama? Or are you looking for a mama? As a woman, are you looking for a man like your daddy? Or are you looking for a daddy? Can I ask yourself these questions? Now, you know, when, when we don't have the most positive image of our mother or father, or, or if we just want to have some level of independence or separation, we'll say, no, I'm not looking for that. Well, you are looking for that if that's all that you know. Okay, now, remember the scripture says, evil communication corrupt good manners, right? You know who you're, who you're attached to, who you spend the most time with, is who you're attached to. So you learn, children learn a woman through their mother. You grow up dis disapproving of your mama, but you still learn a woman through your mother. And the same with, with a man. You learn a man through your father. Okay. Today, many don't have the father there, unfortunately, but let's just, let's just take put family all back together. Okay. So you learn a man or woman through the adult that you are raised by. Okay? So now, some of us look at our parents, I don't want to be like that. Well, just saying I want to be like that because they're like that doesn't mean that you're not going to be like that. Because what you've been exposed to all your life is that. That's what you've been exposed to. Then you're going to do differently. You're going to become just, just what you were raised in Unless you work to not become it, you're going to become it. You're not going to not be it because you're not going to be it. I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to. No, no, no. You've got to, you've got to make a concerted, a conscious, conscientious, a very deliberate effort to not practice or repeat bad behaviors. You have to think about it. And you have to reject the temptation of doing it or not doing it. I don't have time to go through all that. It's not psychology. This is, this, this is not psychology. This is the Word of God. It's not sociology. This is the Word of God. I'm not trying to get in anybody's mind or your emotion, your feelings. This is the Word of God. And the foundation of the Word of God is nothing but truth. That Word is truth. Uh, have you been honest about who your daddy is? Who your mother is? Do you really prefer their attributes? Hmm. Have you seen some of them in you? Hmm. Some of those attributes about your mom and dad that you don't care for, have you seen some of those things in you? I teach you all the time, a woman who's dependent on a man, emotionally so, dependent on a man, and, and dependent means that when a man's not around, she's miserable, she's unhappy, she's always pursuing a man. Mama always has to have a man in her life. Have you developed that tendency? Daddy always has to have more than one woman. Then have you developed that behavior? question. You have to be honest with yourself. You're not going to be different because you're different because you, in fact you are the same. You know the old saying, you are what you eat. Huh? Now, another question. Do you have common goals? 
Do you have common goals? Or do you both have goals at all? Some folks don't have any goals, have no dreams. They just want to get married, say get in the bed. No goals, no dreams. Oh, I feel, oh, I, oh, ooh, when I get around her, I just feel, oh, my heart. Okay, and? And? Let me tell you, you want to get married on, based on feeling? Because, I, because they make my heart leap? Is either of you uh, emotionally needy? And if the other person is emotionally needy, can you deal with that? See, I can't deal with emotionally needy women. I have no interest. Because I'll ignore you. So I know, no, I can't deal with that. I won't deal with that. Whether I can or not, I won't. How about that? But you have to be honest with yourself. Well, we're saved. Because you can both be saved. Doesn't mean more. Even though the drink of this coffee good. Because yeah, you both say that means no work. It's because we say we're going to get married. No, no, no. no. For one, everyone that's saved doesn't have the commitment to obeying the word of God. Some folks too lazy to obey the word of God. <laughs> Are you both financially and emotionally ready to be married? Are you both financially and emotionally ready to be married? Well, I love you, right? Where are you going to take me when we get married? To mama house. Well, let me stay at my mama house then. Where are you going to take Oh, I got a hotel room. I'm paying by the week. Well, that's good. Keep paying. Emotionally. A woman can't be a woman for the man not being a man. How come we get in trouble? You always falling apart, man. The woman came and fall apart. She came and enjoy life and fall apart for a second. Just to be the weaker vessel. Just to, just to enjoy falling apart. Because he a punk. You can keep dealing with that punk. Falling apart. Every little thing. Every, every week he has another job. Because he can't stand it for nobody to disagree with him. You can live with that. Yeah, okay. Another question. What is the difference? and educational attainment uh, in degrees and so forth and so on. Is it a potential problem? Uh, does she earn more money than you, man? Do you earn more money than him, woman? Can you both deal with that if that's the case? Another question. Who does the money belong to? When only one spouse is working. Or there's a big difference in income. Who the money is? The woman stays home. <laughs> the woman stays home every day, take care of the house and the children. The man goes to work and he controls all the money and she can't spend a dime. She, she doesn't even know the bank account, doesn't know anything about it. Can you live with that woman? You know that man come home saying it's my money? You do what I say? When you have been home all day, take care of the house and, and, and take care of those children? Do you really want that to happen to you? No, you better figure it out beforehand. And, and trust me, you got to stop. You can't evaluate folks with your heart. Your heart gets you in trouble. You're stuck in your feelings. You missed all that drama because you were stuck in your feelings. Feelings get you in trouble. What about your cleanliness habits? Are they compatible? Is she clean enough? Is he clean enough? Look at how he treats his mother. Does he care about his mother? Does he spend time with his mother? Because, trust me, if he mistreats his mama, there's something wrong with him. You know what I'm saying? If he mistreats his mama, there's something wrong with him. I don't care if his mama's a crackhead. If he mistreats his mama, there's something wrong with him. But she is his mama. That is any, that's your mama. You can't respect your mother. How you gonna respect me, all right? Uh, what about children? Do you both want children? How many children do you want? You don't. 
You think it's going to be all right. And, I, this, and I'm not talking about going through somebody's psychological session. I'm talking about being rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Well, how many children do I want? Well, according to the Word of God, I'll take as many as God gives me. How about that? If God allows them to come, then He'll provide for them because I'm, I walk by faith. But then you say, well, yeah, but we only want to have two and a half children. <laughs> then we're going to tie some tubes or do birth control. Well, do you believe in birth control? You have to ask these questions. But what does the Bible say? Well, we're not covering that today. But these are these are issues that we have to we have to address. All that man wants to do is lay around and make babies, but he doesn't want to go anywhere and, and to be able to provide, take care of them. Well, do you want a joker who can only make babies? Do you want a joker who can make babies and take care of babies? Ain't nothing, ain't, I know the bed's undefiled when you're married. But there's something defiled about all he wants to do is make babies and doesn't want to do the job to take care of any babies. Can you deal with that? Uh, 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 just, you know, what about goals in life? What are, what are your life's goals? What do you want to do in life? I don't know. One day at a time. And we do walk. We, we live one day at a time. We walk by faith one day at a time. But we do have goals. You have no goals. You have nowhere you're trying to, to get. No, that means you're not going anywhere. If you're not trying to get anywhere, you're not going anywhere. What about the importance of your spouse's goals? Do they mean anything to you? What she wants, what he wants? Men. What, what, well, I ain't saying what she wants. I'm the man. Well, really? You don't care about your wife's goals. I mean, I want to go to school and get a degree. You don't know. Whoa, 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 whoa. But that's her goal. Why are you fighting her goal? Hmm. If you fight your goal, then you can deal with that. Hmm. Now, the question is this. Does the person fall short of your standards, but you decide you can fix them? I'm going to marry me and fix the upper. You bought that house and the house needs to work, right? So they reduce the price. And you buy, you buy your fix upper, fix it up, and you live happily. People don't work like that. Can't do that with people. <laughs> yes, yeah, so again, you leave me alone. You can't do that with people. You can't, you can't marry a fix upper. Well, I'll fix them up. You know, if I put a suit on them, if I buy her a new dress and I buy her a new hat, she might look better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, uh, so, you, so it doesn't meet your standards, but hey, I can fix them up or I can work around it. How do expectations influence or affect perceived Results. How do expectations uh, influence or affect perceived results? Well, I accept the way as well. You know what? She is much better than she was two weeks ago. Is she so different? Oh, it really, she changed. So now, it's important to seek guidance and instruction. As we look to move into marriage relationships. And again, I'm not telling you got to go talk to down on somebody's sofa and have a conversation. Uh, and quite frankly, just let me say this. Unfortunately, I think most pastors are not equipped to answer that question because too many of them are unhappily married. Now, what we must be careful of is seeking perspectives and ideas that reinforce our own thoughts as opposed to seeking godly counsel from true men and true women of God. You want to sit down with somebody who says, you know what, that's exactly what I felt. I, we, were, we were on the same page. I, you passed me everything that I, that I was thinking. You were just saying it. Ooh, that's probably a problem probably a problem. Right now, we're not resting against flesh and blood. This is spiritual warfare. When we go into marriage, it's a spiritual relationship. It's spiritual. We both like basketball. And 
Hannibal Lecter loves Eve. I do too. We have that in common. But he like these people. That's the problem. See what I'm saying? We gotta be careful, y'all. We gotta be careful. Well, we we don't. You know, it's a spiritual thing. What are you seeing spiritually? Is it really working out? So we've got to look for godly men and godly women, women, and seek godly counsel. Got to be true. Got to be careful who you choose to counsel you. You can't sit with everybody and receive counseling. And let me tell y'all something. Folks who always who always uh, chomping at at, 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 at at the bit to, to counsel folks, cancel them. All right. Every time you talk to me, I got to sit down. I got to give you counsel. Everything, every conversation, I'm counseling you. Cancel that. Right. See, because folks who always want to get counsel want to run your. Always counsel. They want to run your life. Leave them alone. Run your own life. You can't ask me a question or present me with a situation without me having to take you to school on it. Why can't I just sit down and listen to you and not say anything? Just listen. You got it out. Let it go. Every time you say boo, I got some counsel. I got somebody to commit, child. Let me tell you. What am I doing? These are spirits that run around in the church. And they hurt people. They hurt people. Because they're always in your business. Don't call me up 2 o'clock in the morning talking about your wife. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> oh, don't call me 2 o'clock in the afternoon either. Don't call me dogging your wife. Dogging your husband. I don't want to hear that conversation. No. If you both want to come and talk, don't come to me for counsel. I'm not counseling you. If you won't obey the word of God, don't worry about my words. I'll simply remind you what the Bible says. And try to help y'all talk through it. To mediate. Tell one of y'all, hush, let her talk. Hush, let her talk. All right, stop. Now you got grace. I don't mind doing that part. To help us have a conversation. But folks, is all you want to say. I just got all the advice for you. Well, honey, you know, you got to make sure now. You know, he work all day. You got to, when he come home, go, whoa, 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 stop, mama. Hold on. And I mean, and there's some good count. Now, I'm talking about women of God, which she'll tell you about how to do that stuff. But some, it, it's a shame for, you got 60, 40, 50, 60, some of your women, they trying to tell you all the nasty stuff and how to seduce your man. When he come to the door, child, you got to give him something good to look at. Hey, yeah, 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 cut that out. This is we people of God. All right, know how I, from, from from birth we know how to be sinful. Stop playing. If you got to seduce a man of God, if the way to keep if you if you say you're married to a man of God, and the way to keep that man in your house is through the bed, something wrong with your house. If you're only going to stay because of good good sex, and he ain't for you. Can I just say that plainly? That's right. Can I butcher it for a minute? Yes, you can. How can he be for you? And only the only time he's happy with you is when he's between your legs. Or vice versa. Not just the men, women too. Y'all yeah, got some stuff going on with y'all too. But that's not the point. That's not the really focus of today. But don't let the flesh dictate what happens. Don't let your flesh get you in trouble. Uh, and you find yourself a lifetime of trouble. So good counsel from uh, a true, powerful a uh, wise woman or man of God is going to do great things in our lives. But you got to be careful. Now, the Bible tells in Proverbs 11 and 14, says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. The counselors are from God. Where the instruction is from God, if you listen, you prosper. Uh, Proverbs 15 and 22, uh, Solomon writes, Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So don't be afraid. See, don't, don't think because you watch your mom and daddy in a marriage, you know what marriage is. Because your marriage won't be their marriage. Right. Tell what I know. You understand? You got to learn for yourself. Because I was raised in church doesn't mean I know about being saved. I just know about church. You don't know about being saved until you are Say, power of things between hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. 
in thy latter end. So many are too old. You know the, the saying, ain't no fool like an old fool because they despise counsel. Now, you could, you could sit in counseling all day long, but if you don't listen and, 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 and take the, the uh, advice, then you despise counsel. And so, you know, what we're arriving at, uh, don't marry him, leave her alone, is not a directive to tell you what to do, but to tell you instruction, to tell you how to do as you navigate life, relationships, and whether you're married or unmarried. Some folks marry the folks who don't need to be with you. Because if he beats you all the time, he's not your husband. He's your abuser. That's another topic, though. Right. But those are things to consider. Ooh, every time like we talk, we get into an argument. Oh, do y'all all get married? Every time we talk, we get to, we get into an argument every week. Oh, y'all all get married? I didn't say a disagreement. An argument. Well, I ain't, I ain't talking to you. You go two days out. We're going to get married. All right, well, go on. But you're not listening to counsel. Your own counsel. Your, your own counsel has te is telling you that y'all don't get along. Y'all live on different pages. Why would you marry somebody who's living on a different page? You understand? When you take a novel, you take let's take a novel that, that follows people through uh, ages. When those two children are in school, in elementary school, when they get to high school, they're not the same children who were in elementary school. Now they're in high school, they're different people, right? The Johnny, who was in kindergarten with Mary in chapter 1, when you get to chapter 10, Johnny's in high school. If the chapter 10 Johnny's looking for the chapter 1 Mary, it ain't going to work. The chapter one, the chapter ten, Johnny has to have the chapter ten, Mary, and the chapter ten, Johnny and Mary have to have developed from the chapter one, Johnny and Mary, to the chapter ten, Johnny and Mary. They're still left there, but all of you can remember is how we were when we were in middle school. But now you're in college, now you're grown. It's not that person at all. Don't delude yourself into thinking, into believing that, oh, I remember we had so much fun together. That was then. This is now. Well, we've grown apart. Well, better say that before you say I do. And stay apart. So, so many issues uh, we have to potentially confront. Uh, like respect. Whose responsibility is it to respect? What is respect? Is respect using a soft voice? It's not like using a soft voice and, just, and totally tear you apart. I'm talking about disrespect you in a soft voice. You think because it's a, it's a harsh voice, harsh tone, that they're being disrespectful, being mean? Maybe they figured out you can't hear if it's not hollering. As much as you say you hate hollering, but if somebody's not hollering at you, you can't hear them. So that person that's hurt has figured out how to communicate with you. If they don't get you mad, you won't think so that they figured out how to communicate with you by having to get you mad. Not because they want to get you mad, but know how to communicate with you. Are you like that? Can't someone just talk to you? Or does it have to be extreme measure before they can get through to you? Just questions. Respect. Whose who's responsibility is it? Is it the husband's responsibility? Is it the wife's responsibility? The scripture told, told the husband to honor his wife that she's the weaker vessel. Alright, y'all figure that part out. Um, here, here's another issue. Like mother, like daughter. Like father, like son. Are these perspectives accurate? Well, she ain't like her mother. Well, hold on, hold on. There's a natural you and there's a spiritual you. The natural you is you. The spiritual you is what you allow the Holy Ghost to change that's wrong with your natural you. That's the spiritual you. you don't, you're not lazy, get saved, and now you're no longer lazy. You're lazy, you got saved. 
Now you're saved and lazy, or lazy and saved. You have to become unlazy. Now the question is, are you going to change? Well, think about that. He's not worked a job ever. He's 30 years old. He's never worked a job. He stayed for a week or two, maybe a month somewhere. Now you think about that. Is he stable enough to be there? Well, I love him. Well, okay, but I mean, but let's see, his father was like that. Look at his daddy. Look at his, look at her mother. Her mother has to have a man in her life. Period. She doesn't care what kind of piece of man he is. He can be abusive. He can be a bum. He can be broke, towed down, dumb as a door not does not matter. She just needs a a, 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 a male with a pulse in her life. Question now, you have to ask yourself, is, is she like a mom? Now remember this now, because when her mom was her age, she wasn't as bad. The older you get, the worse your bad gets. Okay? The older you get, the more your bad shows up. Now when you're young and crazy, not nearly as bad as you get older and crazy. A woman who's a, a young whore, they look like an old whore. See what I'm saying? She gets old as if she's young. She's a young whore. Or he is. They've not changed. They get older. He's old, an old whore. You know what those verses than a young whore? An old whore. Well, she's not as bad as her mama. Well, keep living. Now, the question is, is she going to become her mama? Is she going to become his daddy? Because you are what you eat. I mean, the... I don't know. I'm just. I'm just saying. These are questions that you need to raise. You have to, we have to get in the habit of asking questions. Are they? Or are we willing to deal with each other uh, to compromise until the good feeling leaves? See, when you that good feeling makes you put up with stuff that you didn't imagine you would, because you just got. But when all that is gone, and now it's a sober feeling. That remember that thing that was bad then, but because of your good feeling, it was okay. You excuse it, you forgave it, you ignored it, or you you thought, oh, I'm, that's going to change once we. How did that work out for you? They change, or you change. How about they see more clear, clearly, you see more clearly. Seeing more clearly brings about seeing differently. That does not mean people change. Maybe your head was dug in the, st in the sand when you should have been honest with one what they are. You're so desperate to be with somebody until you, you ignore and excuse everything wrong about them because you're so desperate to have a man, you're so desperate to have a woman, you'll just you'll just settle for whatever comes along. All because you're just desperate to have somebody in your bed at night. First night or two, y'all be like this, holding each other. Give you a few days, you be sent. Y'all on either side. And guess who in the bed with you? Nobody. They way over there, they way over there. Y'all ain't with you. Just think, I mean, just, just things to think about. Now, the, the answer is in the Word of God. I don't have nearly enough time. This would take me a long time, y'all. This would be multiple, and I'm not into doing series unless God says so. And God didn't want me to, to move from this. We'll see what happens. Uh, but just think about, you know, feeling good. the good, warm, fuzzies go away. What happened? You know, think about that. Uh, your, your yes to marriage based on emotion? That's your yes. And your no, when it's when you're married, when it's not going to be divorced. Is that based on emotion? Well, you separate because you got upset, you're mad. I love you. Well, you love them because you're emotional. Practically all of us who grown met somebody in our, especially in our younger years, when you met somebody, you were all messed up emotionally. Couldn't breathe, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. It's all messed up on the inside. And some of those you look back on and say, what kind of fool was I? But in the moment, you were who and what you were. Messed up. 
Thank God the Lord told you you couldn't get married without your mom or daddy's signature. So you couldn't marry him because you sure would have at 13. Because you thought you were so in love. But y'all y'all had a fight. And the next day, y'all said, we've been through so much together. <laughs> Ooh, we've been through so much. How, y how long y'all been dating? Two months? Three months? Four months? We've been through so much. If y'all been through so much in two or three, four months, y'all shouldn't be together. Something wrong. Y'all been through too much. It's such a brief amount of time. Why are y'all together? All y'all done, done been through all that stuff for these few little months. Oh, my word. But thank God, the law, the law, man's law, protects us from some of these foolishness. <laughs> uh, here's another question. Should we change once we are married? Should we change once we are married? Do we change once we're married? The woman I married 10 years ago Five years ago, is she the same woman? Now, if she's the same today that she was then, in every way, something wrong. Time brings about a change in all of us. The question is, are the changes for the better or for the worse? Understand? A man mar meets a woman, marries a woman who is uh, doesn't have doesn't make a lot of money. She's working on school, what have you. So she's a she's a captive kind of audience because she's dependent on him pro providing. The question is now, once that woman becomes uh, degreed, starts making some real money, what have you, can take care of business, and she decides to flutter her wings. I'm not talking about disrespecting no man, but whereas before she always came to you and asked if she could buy because she saw it because you, you, you showed it as your money, so she saw it as your money, baby, can I spend this? Can I? Or maybe y'all don't have enough. And she was trying to make sure. But now she starts making money, goes spending money. I'm not talking about a woman now, but I'm talking about she goes and she goes and buy her a dress. She needs a new dress. But she didn't come and ask you, could she buy a dress? Now, you ready to slap her? <laughs> or tell her that's a nice dress? <laughs> <laughs> that's a question. That's a question. You have to know, these are, you know, or, or not just to, the vice versa, the, the, the man too. Well, these, I mean, these are just questions that we have to ask. We have to ask ourselves questions. Is this man I want to marry really heterosexual? Is this woman I want to marry really heterosexual? Do they like the opposite sex for real? Because that's what I am. Because there's not opposite sex, it's not marriage. It's not God's marriage. That's right. Let's get that straight. We're talking about marriage from a man and a woman. Opposite sex. Mm -hmm. okay. So, if uh, looking at them, I noticed that every time she's with women, she loves to rub them down. She's always rubbing on women. She loves to hug the women. We, she not have very little little interaction. But she loves rubbing women down. Hmm. We've been married for three years. She'll never hug me. But she loves, every time I see a woman, she's hugging that woman. All right, let's move on. That's not what we are. We're just, just raising the question. So God doesn't leave us without Bible instruction or Bible examples. And so there are solid examples, Bible examples, of how strong our love for one another should be. Uh, of course, we consider Abraham and Sarah. And the Bible says that Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her uh, when she died. She died, Sarah died in Kirjath Darba, uh, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. He loved her. He loved her so much that when she died, it was way too much for him. It brought tears to his eyes. He, he wasn't happy because he was gone. He said, but he was dead. See, those were the tears of sorrow, not tears of joy. Some children was dying or uh, crying because they have it. Oh, it's too big and too long. But they put it in the ground. I'm talking about that guy. Let's look at Isaac and Rachel. Uh, uh, Rebecca. Uh, their first encounter in Genesis 24, verses 61 through 67. This is what the Bible says. And Rebecca arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. 
And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well, the heroin, the heroin, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to, to meditate in the field at the at eventide. And he lifted up his eye and saw, and behold, the candles were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the candle. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother's mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah. And she became his wife, and he loved her. Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The wife came. Isaac received her. She, Rebekah received Isaac and his dead mother. He, 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 he was mourning his, his mother's death and this wife comes and eases his pain. Uh, and there's Jacob and Rachel. And we know uh, Jacob and Ra Leah and Rachel. Uh, but Jacob loved Rachel so much that he was willing to work all his 14 years for her. Uh, in Genesis 20 and 18, right? And Jacob loved Rachel. He said, I will serve these seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. I'll work for you to get that girl. He loved her. Understand? He loved her. And he was willing to do the work to get the one he loved. So you have to ask yourself the question, woman, woman, is he willing to do the work to get you? Now, I'm not talking about pestering. I'm not talking about call you a day, you can go out, day, you know, that night. I'm talking, I'm talking about having a, he has a platform of stability. Of, of upward mobility where he's clearly uh, following a path somewhere that is consistent with the will of God um, and, and whatever that path may be, whatever means, whatever his school, his work, whatever trade, whatever the case may be most importantly or as importantly is he a man of God? You say you're a woman of if you say you're a woman of God, why wouldn't you hook up with a man who's not a man of God? First, got to be a man. I'm not talking about sexual preference. You've got to be a man. A man is willing to take on responsibility of providing for his woman. A man of God doesn't uh, uh, conduct himself according to the standards of man, but he, he looks at the word of God. A man's responsibility, according to God, is to take care of his wife and his children. And that's not just money, but it is money. But it's not just money, but it includes money. But it's not just money. The man has to be emotional stability in the home. If every little thing that goes wrong, daddy falling apart. <laughs> what kind of example is he to his family? He popping his neck and carrying on. What kind of? You understand? So, 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 so. The bottom line is that marriage will only work when it is lived as God instructs through His written word. Psychology, philosophy, theology, opinion, personal experience. What mama or daddy had to say, uh, the, prof the professor's perspective, the politician's opinion, none of them will work when it comes to experiencing true happiness and harmony in our marriages. The church is guilty of confusing God's simple instruction to all mankind by trying to simplify it. The problem is, it's so simple until the fool can err in it. But it's unfortunately so simple for the people who are willing to simply do what God says uh, to, be dis to be misled by an ungodly spirit in the church that presents itself as the spirit of God. 
but there has to be a sincerity about obedience to God and there's consistency in your walk in Christ all manner of your walk prior to being married none of us are authorized or empowered to change what God has said regardless of our perceived position in the church the Bible says if you add or take away let you be accursed we dare not add we dare not take away so if she is not a true woman of God and you are at least consider yourself to be a true man of God then you need to leave her alone if her lifestyle if his lifestyle is not consistent with what is written in this Bible leave them alone don't marry him because he has money but he has no God don't marry him because he says he has God but he ain't got no money and I don't mean I don't mean he's rich I mean he's not going anywhere he has no plan he can't take you somewhere to live then why are you marrying him he can't take you somewhere to live then why are you marry him he can't take you somewhere to live and he's supposed to be a grown man and you get some young folks you know you, you, one thing understand this when people say I love him I love her I'm not the guy to tell them don't because you're not going to change anybody's mind because of what you say when two people make up in their mind they're going to marry each other you can get out of the way and if you get in the way you're going to push them close together faster Understand? So you gotta give people space to to uh, to assess what's really going on, and and have confidence that if you teach them the truth of God, that they will do what's best, even though you may be tempted to do what's not best. But no sense in you trying to tell somebody, well, I don't think you should. No, 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 no. And the truth of the matter is, it's not for me to tell you what you should or should not do, who you should or should not marry. The Word of God says it. But I, but I promise you this, if you're godly and they are not godly, the Holy Ghost will be telling you to run. So now, if you are drawn to ungodly men and you say you're a godly woman, you better check the spirit that's in you. If you say you're a godly man and you're always attracted to ungodly women, you've got to check the spirit that's in you. How can two walk together except they be love not the world neither things that are in it. And that includes if any man love the world, love the father is not. I don't care how fine she is. Leave her alone. Leave her alone. She's not good for you. Well, we, we both say I know, but y'all are on different pages. Every time I say left, she says right. Every time I say up, she says down. Leave her alone. Because you have to ask yourself some, some questions. We all have to be honest with ourselves, right? So you got to ask yourself a question before you ever get married. As a woman, the woman has to ask herself this question. Do I respect that man? Can I respect him as a man? Do I respect his word? Can I trust that he will give me the proper instruction in life? Because the head of the woman is is this male qualified to be my head? And that spiritually and naturally, is he qualified to be my head? If there is one iota of a doubt that he is, then you better leave him. If there's one iota of a doubt that she's not going to be a submissive woman according to the word of God, if she will not obey her husband, she has a problem with following, then you better leave her. Unless you're a man who needs to be led around, then she's the one for you. Because you need her to tell you what to do. 
And that's not godly, but for your natural self, that is what you need. But you've got to see there are things about people that, that are contradictory to the will of God. When you say you're walking in the will of God, and you set up for somebody who's not walking in the will of God, you walk out of the will of God. God doesn't give us fixer-uppers. He, he doesn't tell you, woman, when you marry him, and, and uh, I know he's, a, he's an abuser, but I'm going to make him not be an abuser. No. God didn't have you to marry somebody for you to be abused. No. You know, we say, you know, oh, I heard all my life in church. Well, that's your snake. You gotta no, God didn't tell you to say no snake. God never told you. The last time a woman had a conversation with a snake, we all got in trouble. Leave that snake alone. God wants you to have a man, a godly man, a man of, at, at his own heart. That old piece of mail because it's got a pulse. Want to marry him? I know he sits in the rostrum with the collar on. Don't marry him. All he ever wants to do is preach. Never wants to work. Don't marry him. He goes to no job, goes to no school, 20-something years old, cannot speak proper English, and it is his primary language. Will not go to school for nothing. Look at his transcript. Harley went to school, terrible grades. Why are you marrying him? Oh, because he gets some church and clowns. No substance to what he's saying. Come on, because he can sing, play an instrument. Don't marry him. I know he got up and prophesied in church. You got all excited. Everybody was saying, go ahead, Ricky. You know, that's my man. Don't marry him. Oh, you didn't notice he always liked to hang out with the guys. You're his girl, but he always liked to hang out with the guys. Every time you see him, he's with the fellas. And I don't mean he's with the fellas playing ball. Don't marry him. No. Don't do it. She's been saying she's saved for... for for 10 years, she's got three children, all different fathers. And she's been saying she's saved for 10 years, all her children under 10. Don't marry her. All she had been is saved and pregnant, but no husband. Leave her alone. Leave her alone. She's got to run her mouth. Every time I go to church, she's running, she's talking on top of the mountain. How good God is saved, sanctified, but she keeps in spiritual trouble. Every week she's got a different man. Well, she says she's a woman. Leave her alone. People have serious issues. Look at her mother. Look at his father. Look at her father. Look at his mother. Look at where they come from. You see their home is crazy. Leave them alone. Unless you want crazy. Now, you know, you're crazy. They're crazy. Well, maybe crazy work together. <laughs> They're unstable. Well, this week, he wants to marry you. Next week, no. Two weeks ago, yes. Three weeks ago, no. This is not rocket science. This is not required a genius to figure this out. Leave them alone. Stop marrying the wrong people. Stop it. Stop letting the church put you together. Let other folks put you together or separate you. Some folks ought to marry them, but they let the church not to keep them separated. Why well, look like coming to you and interfering in your relationship? Come here, let me talk to you for a second. You don't you, she no good. Really, preacher, with your no good self, don't get happy with your wife. Because there are some preachers, some pastors don't want the women to get married because they don't want them to have a man. Because they want to be their man. Yeah. Now understand, because some don't understand, this, it's not always because you want to be their physical man. But sometimes you're, you're happy being their emotional man. And as long as you have them always coming to you for counseling and advice, and they come and they come to you and they talk to you, they perk up because you just, you just ooh, that just turns you on. Now I'm not talking about necessarily a physical, sexual thing, but it's an ego thing. Now your ego is stroked because somebody came, they need you, she's needy. Every time she gets in trouble, she calls me. So a man comes along, she starts calling you, now you have a problem. So what you want to do is break up that relationship so she'll resume calling you. And the woman too dumb to know what's going on.
Because he hasn't hit on me physically. Yeah, but emotionally, he's all up in you. You all up in him. Leave it alone. So if you see her and she's emotionally stuck on the preacher, emotionally, I'm, I say because she's obedient to the word of God, the man's preacher, teacher. But she, her emotions are caught, caught up in preacher. She's probably not the one for you. That's a church girl, not, not a Jesus girl. You understand? But we have to identify these things. You know, I raised a bunch of questions. And the, and the point is to not tell you what to and to not do. The point is for you specific, specifically not to give you answers. The, the, the mission here is to push all of us to ask questions. You can't go blindly into relationships without asking questions. And ask questions where you are sincere about wanting an answer from God. And God will give it to you through, through whomever. But God will give you the information. Then it's for you to either receive it or reject it. God can't make you receive what he gives you. And a whole bunch of folks, God gave the information, but they rejected it. See, because you look for information that made your flesh feel good. Well, I prayed about it, and God told me, God confirmed our relationship. You didn't, no, 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 God didn't. Your flesh did. You had it in your mind from the beginning. I love him. God can come down and show himself to you physically and tell you no. You'll ignore it because you love him. And you'll turn around and say, oh, God confirmed. See, because you called God, that was the devil. <laughs> the devil came and told me no. I know that was the devil. That was God. God told you no. Because God didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. Then you call God the devil. But that's not the word. That, that, that. No, your flesh is dictating. That's why we got to stop in church. And my God told me. That's my, that's my, cut that mess out. Lying on God. Your loins told you that's your wife. Your eyes told you that's your wife. You looked at her. You got all, all worked up. So that's my wife. Because you thought about the goodness of her and all she can do for you. <laughs> Y'all understand me? Amen. We're choosing based on physical needs and, and, and lust, not based on being led by God. <clears throat> We're good friends. Doesn't mean we should be married. No. You got to do what God says. Doesn't make sense to me, but it makes sense to God. And God gave you, God gave you, if he, if he filled you with the Holy Ghost, and you obey his word, you won't go wrong. Then when God speaks to you through someone else and tells you, no, baby. See, sometimes God will move on you to ask the question, but then you'll get in flesh and reject the answer because it wasn't the response that you were looking for. How many folks contact Pastor Gandhi for information with questions they want? They want and I don't, I don't do counsel. I don't mind an advisor. I tell you what the Bible says, but they reject it. They go the opposite direction because I didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. No, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says. I didn't tell you God didn't appear to me in a dream. I know the Word of God. This is what the Word of God says. Obey your husband. There is no if. It says obey your husband. Huh? Now, if that man is ungodly and you chose him, you got to go to God and say, God, I got to get rid of this ungodly who I made a mistake and chose But as long as you choose to remain with him, you are to obey him. Right. right? So do the work before you get in trouble. Don't hook up with him so you don't have so you have to unhook. Do the work before you get in trouble. So I'm not I'm not, I'm not talk a lot about my experiences, but I thank God for the word. But if you listen to the word and look at reflecting your experience, you realize that oops, if I'd obeyed the word, I would have. It's my testimony. <laughs> if I obey the word of God, but well, I know better. That's why the bottom line is this, is that I can teach this lesson all day long, but people are still going to do what they want to do. Because most of us operate in the flesh and misidentify it as the spirit. Ooh, I just feel like I know God. I know God confirmed this. And then after you get married, two weeks later, you're ready for a divorce. So you lied on God twice. 
God gonna get you. He's gonna get you. You can't can't keep playing with God. Don't marry him. Leave her alone. Wait on God. Well, God, I'm tired of sleeping by myself. Good. I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't mad at that part. But wait on God. It's better to sleep by yourself than sleep with the wolf. You thought you had a kitten in your bed till you woke up. There was a lion about to eat you up. All right, but you just thought it your bed. Oh, give me the kitten. Well, if this kitten, why you reach way up here? This is the kitten you reach way up here. Your crazy self. Now you all emotional. Ooh, look at the kitten. That's no king. It's the the old teeth. Look at that mane. That's a lion. Because your distorted mind. You're seeing the lion as the kitten, right? Oh, I look at the kitten. You can come here, man. That's why you can't pick that kitten up, dummy. You thought you picked that kitten up because you'd be deluded. So you do you do foolish things. If it's a if it's a lion, no joy to call it. A lion. If it's a wolf, guess what it is? When you first encounter them and you have a bad feeling, a negative reaction to them, trust that. I'm talking I'm not talking about because y'all all these acting stupid. I'm talking about a, a spiritual thing. The Holy Ghost will show you spirits. Trust that spirit. Trust this. Trust what God shows you then. The first time, mm, I know. But see, you keep hanging around him now, you get used to him. Now, well, you know what? I, before, he couldn't preach. Now, you, well, he, no, he still can't preach because you like him. He can preach to you. But he can't preach a lick because he ain't saying nothing because God ain't speaking. I know I'm killing the language, but I'm going to keep killing for his purposes. Y'all understand? So, stop being foolish. And finally, don't marry him. Leave her alone. Wait on God. Watch God do the work. All right? Amen. That's all right.